Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it's good to see everybody here today. I want to welcome you to Salem, and it's uh, wonderful to see such a great crowd today. And and uh, what a blessing it is to gather as God's people today, um, and to uh, get to hear from our bishop John Berdowski, and uh, to learn more about the NALC, also about uh, uh, the Carolinas Mission District. So we're going to. Uh, have a great uh, time here today as we praise God and as we learn more about our church and God's calling in our lives. Um, there's a um, biography uh, for John, uh, Pastor uh, Bishop John Berdowski on the back, and uh, he's going to share a little bit more, but we're so thankful to have him here today. He was in two weeks in Tanzania, was on a 36-hour uh, plane ride back here, and I think he's doing great for, for all that. Uh, even ran two mornings uh, that he was here, uh, eight miles each time, so uh, I think I think you're amazing. So we're, we're, we're very happy to have you here with all of your energy and your passion, your faith. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, after our time today uh, of, of worshiping together, we're going to have fellowship right out in the front here. We've got some uh, homemade uh, uh, goodies for you and some drink. We're just going, it's just a way for us to continue uh, fellowshipping together and, and, and have some time to meet with the bishop, um, so we want to invite you to that. Uh, the restrooms, I just want to point out where they are. The women's restroom is on this side, and the men's is on this side. And uh, so if you need to use those facilities, please do. Um, again, I want to thank you for being here today. And what we're going to do, we've got sort of the uh, the service of the word from the with one voice that we're going to be using today just to sort of begin and end our time together. And we're going to try to give uh, most of the time to the bishop and some time for discussion and dialogue with him. And um, so we look forward to that. And then um, the Reverend Dr. Nathan Coder is going to uh, represent the Carolinas Mission District today and share, his, share with us a little bit what uh, we as a, as a mission district are doing and things, upcoming opportun opportunities for you to be a part of. Uh, I want to thank uh, Concordia Church for providing the... Uh, the video because they're going to put this on the internet so if we miss something we'll be able to watch it again uh, on the internet so we're very very thankful for that thank you for being here today and helping with that now i invite you to uh, stand as we uh, sing our gathering hymn today uh, my hope is built on nothing less it's printed for you in your book
You are the treasured people of the Lord. And people always the Lord our God. Keep the words of the Lord in your heart. Teach them to your children. Talk about them in your heart. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for all of your good gifts, especially for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we know the gift of salvation. We pray for your holy church that you may equip it in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may proclaim the good news of your love in Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing upon our gathering today, that you would fill our bishop with your spirit as he proclaims uh, both your whole word, law, and gospel to us, and as we learn more about the NALC. We thank you for each person here today that you have called this year and this time. We pray that your spirit would help us to know your peace and presence in all of our lives, O oh Lord, and that you might encourage and empower us to live out our faith in word and deed. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. I'd like to just uh, turn, turn it over now to uh, Bishop John Berdowski, and, and I don't know when you're just when you're ready to show the film. Just like Good. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for coming. It's great to be with you. I, I've been honored to uh, be here after a 36-hour marathon of getting here. Uh, we left Arusha and traveled, uh, that's in Tanzania, and traveled uh, to Zanzibar. Zanzibar to Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to uh, Rome. Rome to Dulles, and Dulles to Charlotte. <laughs> That was 36 hours uh, uh, on and off uh, aircraft, uh, but uh, uh, I did get up early and run. Uh, I didn't have any choice about getting up early. Uh, the clocks are reversed. It's a seven-hour time difference, and so I was waking up at 3:30 uh, in the fourth morning and needed something to do. So I just go out for a run. Uh, not much else to do at that time of the day. But uh, it is wonderful to be here. I'm thankful for uh, the hospitality of Salem and. Uh, for being a part of their celebration and uh, for their hospitality inviting you all to be together today. Uh, and some of you know that uh, uh, we have uh, produced a video. We know that we have guests from some other congregations, uh, some other uh, ELC and other uh, affiliated congregations, and, and so we wanted to begin uh, by just setting the scene about the basics of the NALC, uh, really founded on uh, four fundamental values. Uh, that really frame and shape our life together. Uh, Christ-centered, mission-driven, traditionally grounded, and congregationally focused. Uh, and instead of trying to articulate uh, that to you personally, I'll let the video uh, do the talking and allow you the chance uh, to, uh, to view that first, and then uh, I'll move forward. Uh, before we watch the video, let me also take a moment to uh, pray with you. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for these moments together. The gift of hospitality and celebration of all that you've done in our lives and in our work together. We pray, Lord, that we would keep our focus on you, that we would learn to follow you faithfully every day of our life together. We pray that you would help us to depend on the power and work of your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and strengthen your church. We give you thanks for the lives of those who have come to learn more, those who have come because they're wrestling with decisions. We pray for the comfort of your Holy Spirit to be with them, and even more, the power of your Holy Spirit to inspire and strengthen them as they move forward faithfully following you. We ask now for your blessing upon our time together, that you might be glorified in all we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A lot of Lutherans are wishing they could simply turn back the clock to go back to a simpler time when the local church was the center of life in the community. But that's just not reality. Not only has culture diminished the value of going to church, 
But many have completely turned their backs on the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the only resource to find meaning and hope in living, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lutherans in North America have been asking for a formal church body that is faithful to the Holy Bible in its preaching and practice, and faithful to the teachings of the Lutheran Confessions. We've heard you. Welcome to the North American Lutheran Church. I'm John Burdosky, Bishop of the North American Lutheran Church. We want to introduce you to what has become the fastest growing church body in North America. The NELC has embraced four core values which shape our common life. Christ-centered, mission-driven, traditionally grounded, and congregationally focused. And the place we always start is with the person of Jesus Christ. Our first core value is that we are Christ-centered. We believe the church is about Jesus, who is both our Lord and Savior. We believe that Jesus is the living word of God. He is the content of the gospel. We believe the Holy Scriptures are the written word of God and that the Bible shares the story of God's love for us in Jesus. We are called a confessing church, which comes from Romans chapter 10, verse nine. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here in the Book of Concord are the historic confessions of the Lutheran Church. It's really quite a remarkable book. You ought to read it because we believe that the Lutheran confessions reliably guide us in faithfully interpreting the Word of God. I'm certain you already know the story of the good news of God's redemption for the entire world. But we also take seriously Jesus' great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And so this brings us to our second core value, to be mission driven. When most people hear the word mission, they think about this, global missions to feed the hungry, close the naked, and so on. But we in the North American Lutheran Church believe our primary mission is also much closer to home, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the spiritually hungry people of North America. As more and more churches join us, we want to help them understand that we are not just church members, we are disciples, with a charge to go into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter where. So we have adopted the term mission-driven to indicate that everything we do is driven by Jesus' great commission to make disciples of all nations. One way we are doing that is by planting new congregations. But instead of throwing money at a region, we see our role as facilitating our congregations as they branch out locally and partner directly with mission posts, house churches, and mission fellowships. We are profoundly committed to global missions. Our call to preach the gospel includes billions of people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But what the North American Lutheran Church desires is to encourage local congregations to partner directly with missionaries or mission organizations so they can know them, pray specifically for them, and help them with the needs they have. We are teaming with mission organizations like the World Mission Prayer League and East European Missions Network to help our congregations reach out globally. Yes, we are a new Lutheran church, and we're doing a lot of things differently. But at the heart of it all is that we are traditionally grounded, and that often raises questions like this from Jeff in Mesa. What is your take on the names for God? Well, Jeff, in the scriptures, God specifically reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're committed to using traditional language from the Bible to address God. Our traditional grounding goes even deeper than just this. On our website, thenalc.org, you'll see our focus on the Lutheran Confessions, the Ministry of Oversight, ecumenical relationships, and theology and doctrine. They're all focusing us on the path of Orthodox Christian belief. Here's Mary in Abington. What kind of worship resources do you intend to offer? 
Barry, we're working with Sola Publishing, the new publishing ministry for Confessing Congregations, which has already produced an abundance of Bible study guides and worship resources from a traditional perspective. Taylor in Tyler, Texas wants to know, how do we call a pastor? Well, that's part of my job as ministry coordinator. We're blessed with so many faithful pastors and seminarians coming into the NALC, so we can help connect call committees with candidates. Ultimately, your congregation will call your new pastor, but we'll be there to help every step of the way. Bess in Bessemer City wants to know, what about theological education? Well, it's true that we don't have a seminary yet, but we are committed to working with individuals to help them obtain a seminary education that's faithful to our commitment to Scripture and the Lutheran Confessions. Finally, Sally in Seattle asks, what about the traditional groups like Women's Guild and Youth? Sally, we've begun the nationwide Women of NALC organization. And for young people, we're working with Youth Encounter, a Lutheran organization that provides faithful events for youth. You'll probably have a lot more questions about our life together. So don't hesitate to contact us. Pastor David Wendell just said that we are doing lots of things differently. And one of them is the focus on congregations. Because we believe congregations are where the Holy Spirit does his best work in making disciples of Christ. So our national organization is intentionally lean. Here's our organizational chart. And here is our national office. To keep overhead low, some of us on staff work from our home offices. Local congregations work together through mission districts. Each mission district has elected a pastor to provide leadership for the district. These deans continue to serve as pastors of their own congregations. Because of our commitment to congregations, all NALC churches have an important part in major decisions. Teaching statements, constitutional amendments, and other major decisions must be ratified by NALC congregations before going into effect. We want each of our congregations to have a say in all major decisions. And probably the biggest question you might have has to do with money. How much do congregations have to give to the national church? The answer is simple. You decide. We want congregations to take responsibility for using most of their benevolence funds in their direct relationships with missionaries, mission congregations, and other worthy ministries in their communities. The NALC will suggest a range of support for its ministries, but that too will be a congregational decision. If I were to summarize our values, Christ-centered, mission-driven, traditionally grounded, and congregationally focused in one word, it would be this word, discipleship. Every person I know wants their life to count, to have meaning and purpose. Jesus invites us, as he did those first followers, to an exciting and abundant life, a life that is truly worth living. What seems so strange is that he says the only way we will find that is by engaging in self-denial, self-sacrifice, taking up the cross, and following Him. Another way I have framed that issue is to simply ask, for what cause are you willing to die? For what cause are you willing to give your life? Well, that may sound like a strange question. The truth is, when you have found a cause worth dying for, only then have you also found a cause worth living for. There is no greater cause than the cause of Christ and His kingdom. The pursuit of that cause is life-giving, empowering, redemptive. It is awesome and holy. This is the direction of the North American Lutheran Church. Authentic discipleship, faithfully following Jesus Christ today. And we invite you to join us in that journey. You know, it only takes a simple majority vote of your congregation. And you do not need to leave your current affiliation to join us. 
We would be glad to assist you in that process, so don't hesitate to contact us. We know that following Christ is not the easiest path, but nothing else in this life will provide you with greater meaning, purpose, or direction than a life of discipleship.
And, and I remember asking myself, where have we gone as a church? Because her whole point in the sermon was that this was an opportunity uh, to ensure that no Christian in the name of Jesus would ever treat a woman in such a dire circumstance with such an inhospitable response. Uh, and, and that no Christian should ever treat a woman in such desperate need in a judgmental way. Uh, I kept waiting and listening, anticipating that she would eventually get to the point of the insight that she saw in Jesus' positive response, but she never did. She insisted that this was a negative example of what not to do and how not to act as a Christian, asserting that her superior wisdom now trumps Jesus' method of interaction. And I tell you, when I was done listening to it, I said, her arrogance is only outdone by her ignorance. Her comments reminded me of the words of Isaiah in the 29th chapter of the 16th verse. Isaiah writes this, you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me. Can the pot save the potter? You know nothing. What profound words. His understanding came to mind as I listened or thought through uh, that sermon. That's the kind of deconstruction that has been going on as we've approached these <coughs> scriptures. And I tell you, it has been carefully considered by our African brothers and sisters in Christ. I was just with Bishop Malasusa and the EOCT, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Tanzania. Uh, we were there celebrating 125 years of the gospel coming to that nation. It was a wonderful week-long celebration. Uh, but it was very interesting because every time he introduced us and said, this is the contingent from the United States. There was almost no response. And then he always had to say, not that church. This is another church. From the and then people were applauding. Uh, it, 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 was, it, it got comical after about the sixth time it happened. But they are very concerned about the direction of Lutheranism uh, in the United States. And, and especially... Uh, among uh, the ELCA. Uh, and, and one of the things they said is, you know, you brought us the gospel and you taught us to believe in the authority of the word of God. And because you taught us that, we believed you and we trust today in the authority of the word of God. Instead of deconstructing these miracle stories, they believe that one of the differences between them and us now is they truly believe that this is a God who can act and does continue to act in marvelous and miraculous ways because Christ is God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He is still at work in our midst. They believe that. And as a result, in case you haven't noticed, the epicenter for Christianity has moved away from the north and the west to the south and the east. And we need to pay attention to what God is blessing. They are growing at one of the fastest rates throughout the history of the church. And here we are shrinking. We are losing ground, but the rest of the world in other parts are gaining ground as they reach out in mission and ministry together. And you know, they're aware of the fact that we often treat them with a great sense of condescension and arrogance. Uh, in some regards, they've had EOCA leaders who have said to them, look, when you realize and understand everything that we know, then you will agree with us. <laughs> the leaders of the East African nations wrote a letter to uh, uh, several of the groups uh, in LWF and said, look, we have read the sociologists, we've read the psychologists, we've read, read the geneticists, we've read uh, just about everything that you've read, and we still disagree with you. 
We still dis we disagree with you on the basis of the authority of the Word of God. Uh, and, and so they have also told us that they have another parable that they wanted to share with me. They said, this describes our view of what has happened uh, in the church in North America. They call it the parable of the prodigal father. The parable of the prodigal father. And, and I asked them, well, what do you mean by that? And they say, well, you were our spiritual fathers. You brought the faith to us. And then he said, the son has remained faithful. We've tried to stay at home, believing the truth of the word of God and the confessional understanding that you imparted to us. But it is you who have wandered off and squandered your faith in reckless living and living by the understandings of the rest of the culture around you. We've remained faithful. And now you seek to return without repentance and act as if nothing is wrong with what you've done. That's fascinating. It's always interesting, one of the things I've learned a long time ago, it's very important to look at how people outside look at what's happening. They are not without opinion. They are not without insight. Uh, these are people that have prayed and struggled with the truth of the Word of God and have looked for ways to explain what has gone on here. And we have much to learn from their insight and, and understanding. These are people who have not done away with law and gospel. They understand this unique interaction of law and gospel on a very practical level. Now, some may have thought that our uh, theological conference was a little too lofty uh, and that we didn't get the, to the place of application. Uh, and we're going to try to remedy that for next year's theological conference that we ask questions about how does this apply? Who we'll has good, solid Lutheran questions of what does this mean? Uh, and uh, get to the place of how does this apply to pastoral ministry, to preaching and teaching, and how does this apply to uh, being a disciple of Jesus? How does this apply to congregational outreach into the community? But I want to give you an example of this wonderful way in which they merge law and gospel masterfully and faithfully. I went to visit uh, one of the pastors in the local congregation, and uh, when I went in, there were two women sitting in his office, waiting to see him. The one woman was pregnant, and the other woman was near tears. You could see that she was heartbroken. And the one woman who was pregnant was a member of his congregation, the other woman was a guest of this woman. And he said to her, why have you come and what can I do for you? And so the pregnant woman looked at the other woman and, and she began to speak to him and said, I came for prayer. I want you to pray for me that God would heal me and bless me so that I can become pregnant again. I just had a miscarriage. And so uh, she went on to say a few more words. And then he said, where is your husband? And she said, I'm not married. She said, I'm living with my boyfriend. And then the pastor said, is, has your boyfriend committed to marrying you? And then the tears began to fall down her face and she said, no, not yet. And he said, said, I'm so sorry, but you're asking me to do something that I cannot do. I cannot bless your decision to live outside of the will of God. I cannot bring God's blessing to bear on your situation when you've decided to live outside of the will of God. And if you don't understand the will of God for marriage and for the family, I'm glad to explain it to you. But I need to speak to your boyfriend. 
He said, would your boyfriend be willing to talk to me about this? And she shook her head, no. She said, he said, well, I want you to go and ask him if he'll come and speak with me. And if he won't come and speak with me, I want you to call me and give me your address and a time when I can come to your home and I'll go and I'll present to him what is the will of God for marriage and for the family. And he said, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves both you and your boyfriend. But he loves you so much that he wants you to live inside of his will where there is life and blessing and healing and forgiveness. I thought, what a profound way to articulate law and gospel. He didn't say to the woman, throw out the law, forget God's will, I'll just be glad to bless you. I'll give you anything you want that will make you happy. And yet he was very loving and caring and was willing to put himself out for her sake and for the sake of this relationship. It is tragic and unfortunate, but in our own culture, we have lost the capacity to see how law and gospel needs to be woven together in the nature of discerning the will of God and apply to our interaction with one another and to others. Beyond the <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, that's what I said. They have much to teach us. We need to learn again what that means and how best to move forward in that regard. Uh, it is uh, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, that I had to, to not only preach. Bishop Malasusa is a wonderful man of faith. He is the Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Tanzania. And to listen to him articulate the gospel in a very loving and caring way, but also faithful. Uh, he is interested in developing this relationship uh, with us and gave, and therefore, uh, gave me many opportunities to speak to his people, to preach in their midst. Uh, and, uh, and on one of the occasions, uh, I spoke about 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, uh, because he wanted me to address what has gone on. And Paul's words uh, were also a part of Luther's. I'll read Paul's words first and, and then share Luther's with you. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, The time will come when they will not no longer endure sound doctrine, but they will have itching ears, and will heap up for themselves teachers after their own lusts and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to embracing fables. And, and I suggested to the folks in Tanzania that really the process of transformation that Jesus intends for us is to move from what Paul describes to Timothy as having itching ears to what the disciples experienced on the road to Emmaus. You remember that passage? It was when they were walking and Jesus opened their eyes and their ears so they could hear the truth of the scriptures as he explained them to them. And, and after they break bread with Jesus and he departs, they say, were not our hearts burning within us as he walked with us and explained the scriptures? I said, that's really the, the transformation, isn't it? That Jesus intends for all disciples to experience. To move from being a people who just have itching ears to hear what their own desires are to people who have hearts that are burning with passion for Christ. That's the transformation of discipleship. Itching ears to satisfy our own needs to hearts that burn passionately for Christ and His gospel. Uh, we have a long way to go in that regard. Uh, but it's very important work. Luther uh, says uh, about this text that uh, you heard today as the gospel reading, he said, these two organs, the tongue and the ear, these two organs of the body make a critical difference between the Christian and the unbeliever. 
You see, the ears of the Christian hear the word and the heart believes it. The tongue then speaks and confesses what the heart believes. A Christian is one who speaks and hears differently. The Christian is one who has a tongue which praises the grace of God, that preaches Christ as Lord and the only source of salvation. The world does not speak this way, Luther continues. It speaks of avarice and other vices and preaches and praises its own glory. It speaks of its own wisdom and honors itself. And then Luther adds this admonition. He says, Beware of deceitful tongues which meddle with the Scriptures. Beware of deceitful tongues which meddle with the Scriptures. He said, There is need even now that one should sob because such tongues which mislead so many people and still claim to be Christian and claim that they have improved the Christian church. How relevant is it for our own day and time? See, I just love how Luther takes us into the scripture and leaves us parked right there. Uh, he, he wrote several pages just on the fact that Jesus sighed when he healed this man. Jesus sighed. Why did Jesus sigh? Luther takes up this interaction. Just with one word in this passage from the gospel. He sighed, he said, because he knew this man, once he healed him, he had a tongue that couldn't speak, but soon this tongue would speak blasphemous words about God and his neighbor. He had ears who couldn't hear, but soon he would not only hear the word of God, but he had heard false understandings and teachings regarding the word of God. He sighed. And Luther says he sighed not only for this man and his sins, but Jesus sighed for your sins and mine. Luther goes on to say, do not think for a moment that God doesn't care about your sin. Your sin and my sin still deeply affect Christ. Even though He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, He is not without being deeply touched by such sin. He cares deeply about our sin, and it affects Him today just as great. He sighs deeply. Just with one word, in the text, Luther just stays with what the Word of God has to say. And so should we. So should we. Dig even more deeply into the truth of that God, Word of God and let this doctrinal understanding that influence the way we live out our faith. Folks, that's why the ALC exists. That's what we're struggling to do. Uh, have we done it perfectly? Uh, no. Uh, but we are keeping our attention focused on what we think is absolutely most important. We're following Christ. We're working on discipleship. We're keeping constantly this word of God as the authority and norm for all we say and do. It is a pleasure to serve this church in, in this capacity. And uh, we're delighted to, uh, to be able to go and, and begin these relationships uh, in Tanzania, I can tell you that we uh, offered to uh, work with them to develop a memorandum of understanding. It's kind of the first step, uh, and uh, that will may eventually lead to a full community agreement down the road. Uh, and so we're going to be working on uh, the development of that precursor statement uh, with them. Uh, I can tell you that uh, things went so well uh, that they've invited me to come back and be the keynote speaker for their general assembly um, in. Uh, December. Uh, as long as it doesn't take 36 hours to get there or back, I will consider going. Uh, it's got to be a faster way. Uh, no, actually, the, part of that was our own doing because we went to visit medical missionaries uh, in, up in an area in the north of Arusha, up close to the uh, Kenyan border um, called Kitumben. And, and in Kitumbeni, there are two medical missionaries, or a medical missionary and his wife. Uh, uh, Dr. Steve Freeberg and his wife Bethany that I've known for uh, just about their entire uh, the entire length of their mission work. And they work among the Maasai. 
the Messiah are those uh, uh, warriors that are nomadic, and uh, uh, one of them became a basketball player. Uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, anyone help me out? NBA player, very tall. Uh, what's that? No, 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 more recent than 12. Uh, uh, but any, in any case, uh, Kutumba or what, did, did anyone else remember? What's that? What's that? Uh, no, I don't think that's the guy I'm thinking of. In any case, what's that? Yes, the typical Tongue. Yes, uh, it, 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 he came from uh, Masai country. Uh, they jump, they, these are warriors when they dance, they, they jump, and they have verticals that uh, reach 39, 40 inches of vertical. They can just stand dead still and jump. Uh, 30 uh, inches in the air, 40 inches in the air. I mean, they're just amazing. I've stood there and watched them do it. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, but these are very tall, nomadic. Uh, they can still carry a spear and a sword to fight off lions. <laughs> uh, and and they, if a lion steals one of their sheep, they go after it. I would turn and run, but they go after it. And, uh, just amazing. But uh, we were asking, we were asking the, the Dr. Stephen Bethany Freeberg, what is made their ministry is so successful. And, and, and I want you to know the precursor to that was we already had, had the discussion about their faith. These are people who uh, believe in the authority of the Word of God and our confessional understanding with regard to that Word. And, and they said, John, it hasn't been the buildings we built. It hasn't been the programs we started. It, it, it's been one thing. And, and I said, well, what is that? And they said, investing in people. We've invested ourselves in people. And that really is the nature of discipleship, isn't it? I mean, that's what Jesus did with his disciples. Jesus invested himself in his disciples. And if we're going to make disciples, we have to do the same thing. We have to be willing to invest ourselves in the lives of others. I pointed out this morning uh, that the man uh, in that second part of the gospel for today, who has the lack of hearing and speech impediment, had friends that brought him to Jesus. These friends were willing to invest themselves in his life. And what they did for him ultimately was to bring him to Christ. Folks, there's no better model in terms of directing the course of our lives as his people is to understand that the best thing we could ever do for our friends who are in trouble and in need is to do what that young lady did uh, in, uh, when I was visiting in Tanzania with the pastor. Her friend brought her to the church to hear the word of God. The man in that passage of the gospel brought their friend to Christ. And I was pointing out, you know, you and I are all deaf. We don't hear God by ourselves. Thank God someone brought us to Christ, led us to a baptismal farm where his love washed over us. And as we lived out that baptismal covenant grew in faith and worship and, and discipleship, we began to respond with a confessing tongue that confesses our rightful place in our relationship with God, confesses our sins, confesses Christ boldly and clearly to a culture that is dying to learn of a Savior who truly loves, forgives, and redeems His people. We have much to learn uh, from our brothers and sisters in Africa, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of uh, those conversations uh, and to receive that learning from them and even more importantly uh, to share it with our own people. Let me pause right there uh, and uh, uh, ask if there are questions that, uh, that you have about the NALC and the Yeah? Will there be a part of the NALC We, we've already, uh, there are deaconesses that have already come over to the NALC, and, and we've already taken them in. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. We, we don't have another microphone here, uh, or do we? Uh, that would be helpful if we did to, to uh, pass it around to people who have questions. Uh, she was asking if uh, the NALC will ever have a deaconess program uh, like the ELCA had it. And what we've said is we've already taken in deaconesses who are now
now working with us. Will we have a deacon's training center? Probably not. But the deacon's training center does a very good job with regard to faithfulness and uh, teaching uh, scriptures and the confessions very faithful. Yes, Mother House. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Serve our needs as well. We're not trying to invent the will and start everything on our own. We're trying to look at the best that's already available out there and harness it uh, for our purposes as well. Um, uh, no need to just have a, a stamp of NALC on something in order to uh, make it ours or make it official or to make it uh, function the way we think it needs to. It, 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 there are a number of people already out there doing some very good work. Um, and uh, that's very important. The fact is, one of the things I learned is there there are reform groups working in other countries. Um, you know, I sat next to a Swedish bishop while I was there who voted against the church in Sweden and their direction. And he's very firm in his stance. He said he's virtually been relegated to only representing the church of Sweden in interactions with African nations. <laughs> because the African nations don't want to hear from any of the other Swedish bishops who endorse the kind of decisions the church in Sweden has made. Um, so, but even in Sweden, there are bishops who absolutely oppose the direction of the church in Sweden. In Germany, uh, we received another word uh, uh, from a German group because you know the Scandinavian groups were in Tanzania, and so were the Germans. And uh, so we have different regions in the country that were affected by these different groups. Uh, two uh, German pastors came and said, "There's a, now a movement in Germany." to help bring renewal to the church in Germany because they disagree with the direction uh, of the German church. Uh, so it, it, it's breaking out, folks, in, in, in various parts of the world. Uh, and, and it's very interesting how Africa has been the focus for providing some common ground for those folks who are looking for the kind and quality of leadership and faithfulness that now the African nations represent. So just, just fascinating. Yes. I'd like to make a statement. Sure. I'm James Tyrell. I was a pastor of this church back in the 60s and 70s. Keep the mic up. Keep the mic up a little bit. That's okay. Did you hear what I said? Uh, this is Pastor Styrell. I think you turned up my mic. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, do you hear? <laughs> I'm James Tyrell. I was pastor of this church, our congregation, <coughs> excuse me, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I was in the military uh, during the Second World War, and uh, I went and trained from uh, in, in Camp Robinson, Arkansas. And uh, I learned a lesson in law and gospel. I grew up in uh, Mount Moriah with the church, China Grove. And it had a history of uh, being a member of the Tennessee Senate, which was a bit foreign to our North Carolina Senate back in those days. But uh, the first weekend, I got a pass to go off uh, camp into Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, I wanted to find a Lutheran church. I'd been worshiping in the chapels, of course, on the camp. But uh, I finally found uh, a, a Lutheran church and uh, I didn't notice what Senate it was but uh, on the bullet board that is and I got there just in time for the service to begin uh, and uh, they handed me a bulletin and asked who I was and uh, and I told them, and I said, I'm from North Carolina, and I am a Lutheran. And I've been wanting to get off camp grounds and come to a Lutheran service. And they said, well, our what 
church body, are you a member? And I said, United Lutheran Church. They said, the usher said, well, I'm sorry that you didn't get here in time to speak to our pastor for him to be assured that I was a real Lutheran. And so you may not receive communion. Well, that was a real heartbreaking experience. Now, I have since learned that there are those who are, I would say, more conservative in their interpretation of Scripture. And the Missouri Senate is looked upon as being in that body. Well, I, uh, I see no difference in what I am observing here among you than what I experienced with the Missouri Central Church. All through the years, we in Lutheran churches in North Carolina have done the same uh, programs of worship, of inviting others to become members of our faith and to enjoy a rich relationship with each other. But I see here that you are, in a way, telling me, either as a pastor or a layperson, who I can love and who I can. So, they were telling me that they, in their mind, had to prove that I was a real confessor of the Lutheran faith, according well, to their interpretation. But I, I really appreciate your faithful service to both the church and our country, but uh, I would uh, say to you that, uh, first of all, we don't have close communion. Uh, so we're, we're not making. Uh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, but, well, so it, to, yeah. so comparing us to uh -huh. those who have close communion yeah. is hardly uh, well. <laughs> appropriate. Okay. Uh, with regard to uh, to making the, the statement or the assertion that it's different, or to say that it's judgmental. You see, I believe that it's an ecclesiological decision as to whether the church ever has the right to say to uh, to anyone or to make a ruling. That what the scripture calls sin is no longer sin by virtue of, of some decree. Uh, that's foreign to Lutheran teaching. Uh, and, and so it, one can talk about uh, the being judgmental. It is not our judgment. Uh, it is what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God confessionally is the norm for all matters in life, okay. then so it's this long then, as you're not condemning no. me. Oh, no. As a member and a believer and a worshiper in the evangelical Lutheran Church, there are many faithful people in the ELC. Absolutely, many and there are many faithful people in your group. Absolutely, we don't, we don't, we're not drawing that distinction. You have to. One of the things that's important to point out is that we are not the ones issuing decrees. It, for instance, it was the ELCA that said that no pastor in the ELCA shall serve in a. Uh, an NALC congregation. Nothing to do with the NALC. The NALC has not made any of these kind of condemnations or recriminate remarks. The ELC has. So, so in terms of talking about the judgment that has been rendered, it's important to look at what letters have been sent and what the content of those letters have been with regard to uh, the, uh, the, the pointing the finger at us in terms of a word yeah. of judgment. Well, just one more time. Sure. Uh, I would 
was busy with my wife. I was never able to have attend any of these meetings way back before all of you left the church, as I know. Um, but um, I, I just, just can't help but realize that uh, the church, Mount Moriah Church, had some concerns. And, uh, but they, the pastor reminded them that it's not a matter of you having to accept that to remain in an evangelical Lutheran church. You can simply say that we reserve the uh, interpretation prior to the last decision. Yeah, and, uh, that, and they are still members of the North Carolina Lutheran Senate and are just as faithful to our Lord as any. Well, I, I, you know, so, it, uh, let, me, let me just address, uh, just finish addressing. I, I think that's uh, uh, a very interesting uh, comment. Uh, and I hear that from many people, that the decisions won't affect us. Um, and, and so if they're good decisions or faithful decisions, why does one even need to say what, what effect they will have? If they could have a deleterious effect, then why make the decision in the first place? If, if, if one could simply reject the decision, then why would it need to be made is a, is a greater question. But the other question, the other issue is that as synods begin to use these understandings as the screen by which they let pastors in to the endorsement process before they even get the synod, you will only be left with pastors coming out of such seminaries, and all you have to do is look at what has happened at Southern to draw in line the, the direction and the concentrated effort to make sure that every pastor that we are producing in our seminaries is in lockstep with those agreements and understandings. And those who differ are not given a chance. Yes, you have a chance to differ, but those who are just coming into seminaries don't have that same opportunity. Because I have, and I have, I have evidence of assistance to the bishops who have been there and said that those who disagree with those understandings already are not accepted or endorsed as candidates for ministry. So, in conclusion, all I have a question. Yeah, come on. Um, yeah. Whenever uh, I notice that the NALC is doing more to give the congregations. Yes. Their say so. And we went to all those journeys of faith meetings. I went to every one of them. But it didn't matter what I thought and what I believed. Right. And, you know, everybody started saying, we need unity. But I said, Martin Luther didn't care about unity. He went by what the scripture said. So, if we get a pastor that has these wild ideas and turns against the word of God, and in this NALC, how can we get rid of them? Oh, well, <laughs> you, you answered your own question in that the congregation has the final word in that, in that regard. First of all, if the pastors are preaching and teaching contrary to that, we will intervene. That's one of the reasons why we have the structure uh, and why we have oversight and authority in those matters. But secondly, we also uh, want you to know that um, uh, that that the congregation will be the ones to decide whether or not this candidate or pastor is appropriate. Uh, and there will be methodologies about, and some of them are already spelled out clearly in our constitution and in our model constitution for congregations as well. So it, it is very important. The likelihood of their getting in because of the screening processes that we're using is slim to none. And many who don't believe that way won't bother joining us to begin with. So, yeah. We have, we have a question over here. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And we, we all have our misunderstanding. And uh, I want to say that uh, uh, none of this depends on our salvation. We have a question over here. Yes. And, I mean, if anyone has a question, after this is raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. That might be, I'd like to help us to, to make sure we get it on 
Bishop, I want to welcome you again to you. Sari. I'm glad to have you here. I was wondering if you could comment um, just a little bit on contemporary worship in the NAL NALC. I didn't know if you had statistics or um, some kind of figures uh, to share with us how contemporary worship is being um, held in our new congregations. Um, I know here at Salem we have uh, a fairly new uh, contemporary worship. Uh, we think it's been successful. And uh, I guess my question is twofold. If the numbers was one thing. But also I was going to ask you in your research of the Bible, your scholarly expertise, have you seen anything in Scripture that tells us as Christians how to worship? Is there anything in there that says, you know, thou shalt not play drum, thou shalt not play? Yeah. Um, there's well, been some dissension, and I was wondering if you could clear that up. Well, I would, let me just say that we have congregations that have uh, all kinds of different um, uh, worship uh, formats uh, from contemporary to uh, very, very traditional. Um, you know, we, we think faithfulness transcends people's um, uh, personal desires or concerns with regard to, to worship experience. Um, we believe that uh, folks can be very faithful in worship in a contemporary style, folks can be very faithful in worship in a very traditional style. What's most important is the content. Um, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is very important that um, uh, we, we don't forget that all of these things matter. But that is, the content of what we present matters because that shapes what people believe. To say that none of this is salvational and none of this matters uh, it, it is far uh, from our Lutheran uh, confessional understanding. It does matter. Um, it, it, it does matter uh, that we are a people uh, in prayer, that, we, that God is the center of our worship. Uh, that it is not a form of entertainment, uh, but a, 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 an opportunity to praise God. Uh, and, and Jesus' own words are pretty limited about this, in spirit and in truth. Um, uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, he lifts up uh, as people ask him about worshiping at Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. Uh, he focuses on what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now we come out of a long legacy. It's also very important to know, and I always point this out uh, to our leaders, that our job is not to try to invent the church or reinvent the church uh, or to despise what the past has been in terms of how God has led us and guided us. Uh, you know, we do depend on those who came before us. Uh, uh, their interpretation and understanding of the Word of God. You know, when we gather for communion, um, it, it, it's very important to know that the, the whole body of Christ in heaven is gathered around. Luther has this wonderful uh, explanation of communion in which he says the whole heavenly host are gathered around you, looking down on you as you share in the elements of bread and wine, uh, in the body and blood of Christ. You are communing with all, the whole church. Uh, that's very important. We're connected to something much bigger than ourselves. It's not about a show. Uh, and, and you know, let me tell you, you can be at a show in a very traditional sense, a traditional version, just as much as you can be at a show in a contemporary sense. So I've seen it both sides. Um, and, uh, and both leave me cold. And I have seen people of faith who worship God in a traditional mode and in a contemporary mode. But I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that one size will not fit all. Um, you know, deciding that only one way works uh, is not really a healthy decision for us. Um, you know, when uh, people uh, talk about this and they try to relegate this to the same uh, level as moral decisions that we're making, I said, well, wait a minute. You're talking about the worship life of God's people. These are people who sincerely want to worship God. Uh, you, you, you have to uh, be accommodating, and as priests and leaders of the church, uh, pastoral responsibility here is to make sure we give people every opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, and, and so content is very important. And our, where, where would you draw the line in terms of where salvation rests? Can you, can you have salvation where Christ is no longer looked upon as the Savior of the world? That all paths lead to God and it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. No, no. 
I mean, so, so content does matter. The preaching and teaching of the word faithfully does make a difference. You can't say that in our nature inclusiveness that everything is included and can be included and it won't make a difference because everyone is just deemed faithful by declaring it so. No. Uh, that's not an acceptable response. Uh, and yet I know that's the position that others have taken. I don't believe that rings true with what the Word of God is teaching. Uh, and I believe that, that content does make a difference. Content makes a difference in terms of worship. And let's face it, there are good worship, contemporary worship hymns, and there are bad worship hymns. And, and, and on the, the traditional side, there are songs that are singable and songs that are your hard press to sing. <laughs> Excuse me, but uh, uh, yes, the question. Thanks. Bishop, uh, my name is Ronnie Smith. I'm a resident of Salisbury, Marion County. We want to welcome you back. Thank you. Uh, you've been here before, and this is so important to educate the Lutheran faith in this area. Thank you so much for making this possible. I'm a lifelong Lutheran. I'm a member of two Lutheran churches, St. John's Lutheran Church in Salisbury, one of the largest in this area, and also I attend and I'm an associate member of Christiana Lutheran Church. Uh, I say that because I am very, very, very concerned. Uh, with all due respect to Pastor Steyerwald, he made a comment looking at all of us, why did we leave the Lutheran Church? Uh, I would say to each of us here, we did not leave the Lutheran Church. We are the Lutheran Church. And I think if you look, uh, and I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but if you look at all the Studies that have been made is the ELCA who has left the Lutheran Church. We want to remain dedicated, strong to God's Word. At my home church, I've been a member there for 66 years, we now have a pastor who refuses to allow us to even discuss in ALC or any thought of a vote in our congregation. This has hurt a tremendous amount of people. We've lost a lot of people. But that's my home church. I baptized, confirmed there. It just means so much to me. And for them to deny me that privilege, it, it really does hurt. Uh, at Christiana this morning, the announcement was made, we are going back to some of the liturgy and the Apostles' Creed of the original Lutheran Church in America. And we did it this morning. We put Christ back in our church. And I want to see that happen to every Lutheran church in Rowan County. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm saddened only by the fact that uh, when we hear how the African church looks at us, we pay absolutely no attention to it. It, it, it. What saddened me was his remarks had nothing to do with the fact that it's not just we who look upon the departure of Lutherans in this country from the Lutheran faith, but leaders in Africa have said very clearly you have brought the father. You have deserted your children by virtue of where you've gone with your faith. That's a very important word to hear. And to pay no attention to it is ignorant uh, and, and arrogant, uh, I think. Um, and, and so we must listen to that. And we must, uh, again, move in the direction of restore uh, that sense of faith and trust in Christ as the centerpiece of everything the saying that it's very yeah yeah piggyback, piggybacking off of that a little bit uh, back in Minnesota after we had the resolution the vote on the resolution yes. for LWF yes. the very next morning for those of you who weren't there you missed something very extraordinary you missed your bishop in a moment of repentance um, and that was quite extraordinary something I had never seen before um, and I appreciate that I've also appreciated your remarks and read them over several times since you sent them. And the one thing that keeps ringing in my ears is that you found no joy. Um, and I, I watched you say that, and I know you meant it. Um, and I thought about that, reflected on that. That's what we pastors do. Uh, and I found some joy. Uh, I found joy in knowing that we serve in a church where when we gather seven, eight hundred people in a room, we don't make decisions for the whole body. 
we make a recommendation for the rest of the church to ponder that. Uh, and then we send it to the congregations to make that decision. Uh, that gave me great joy to know that at the time we took the vote and it passed, the discussion was not over, let's move on. Uh, my question to you is, and, we're the, and there's more information coming down for the congregation side, my question to you is, have you found some joy? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Yes, uh, you know, it's good to be a part of the church. Uh, most of the, the lack of joy can be found in the, the timing and the appropriateness. Uh, let me just say a few words about LWF so you know. One of the things that surprised me, and, and, and I faulted myself for not really being aware of uh, some of the dynamics, uh, but it, 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 and the reason I was surprised and shocked by some of it is that in the formation of the NALC, clear back to the visioning group, um, the, the plan was always for the NALC to be an ecumenically involved uh, body. That is, uh, to be involved uh, in inter-Lutheran um, uh, dialogue and, and belonging to those organizations with other Lutherans uh, around the world. Um, it, it is, uh, it, it is uh, in the Constitution. I mean, I, I don't want to quote chapter and verse today, but if you look at the Constitution very closely, it says specifically that we will be uh, an ecumenical body. Uh, and uh, so in the Constitution, we have that. And the, both our constituting com, uh, convocation and the first convocation, following our constituting uh, convocation, both raise the subject of our belonging to LWF. And the resolution, and uh, the first one was a, uh, uh, by uh, acclamation and without dissent. And the second one was a motion to move in the direction of the application without dissent. So, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it surprised and shocked me that there would be um, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the difficulty that this body would have in, in, uh, uh, in reinforcing what had already been stated. And quite frankly, I, I know it's difficult. We've been through a lot emotionally. It's difficult to trust leaders when you've been involved in prior denominations where uh, you know, the, the agenda drum just keeps beating in terms of whatever's coming down. You know, people, wait, wait, what's behind this? Uh, I know and understand that. And, and the other thing, part of my empathy and understanding, uh, I've been on the other side of such votes repeatedly in, in the ELCA. Uh, so I have a distinct heart and compassion for those who are on the short end of the stick. Uh, no matter what the vote is. So, um, and, and, and so it always gives me uh, uh, pause to, to stop and think about it from other folks' perspective. Uh, and I think that's very important for leadership to do. Um, it, it's not just a matter of accomplishing things, but it's a matter of moving together. Uh, and moving together forward in a way that enlists the support of all of our communications. Um, but I, I do want you to know that, um, that yes, I, I have found joy in the fact that some say, well, we don't, we don't want to uh, test uh, what we've done. And some said, oh, man, we're going to be really tested now with regard to this. I said, well, do you believe or don't believe that the, what we put together works? I mean, if you believe that it works, then it's not premature to test it. I mean, we, do we want the only things we give our congregations to talk about are things where they're all just sticking a rubber stamp on something? What kind of deliberation is that? If we truly believe that God's Holy Spirit is at work through the lives of the people in our congregations, then I feel good and I have great joy in sharing information with them and allowing them to decide. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not uh, I'm saying, well, gee, we have to make sure we succeed first before we ever give anything to our congregations to discuss. Uh, I believe that the people of God can hear and respond to these things faithfully without having someone stand up and say, Maybe you just need to follow us no matter what you think. Uh, we'll tell you what's right and what to believe and, and uh, leave, leave it all to us. No, I think we who believe in the, truly in the priesthood of all believers and the power of the Holy Spirit that is already present in our congregations need to trust that our lay can wrestle with these things and make good decisions about them. Uh, and, and that is a part of the nature of the church we put together. So you are correct. That does still give me great joy and great satisfaction. Uh, uh, I, I would uh, also say that, uh, that there is both um, the biblical and confessional stuff that uh, will probably be included in uh, the packets of information that are coming out. Uh, and uh, I do want you to know that uh, Bishop Nalasusa discussed this with us. 
Uh, he is the vice president of, the, of LWF, um, and uh, he is very biased in his understanding. He said, we need you folks there. Um, and the other thing that I would just point out constitutionally, that as the NALC, we don't officially enter into full community agreements with anyone unless it's directly with the church body and it's passed by virtue of resolution and agreement between uh, and, uh, the NALC and the other church body and ratified by our congregations just like we did with EDC and uh, one. And so there's no jumping uh, over the formal process that's already, already lined out in our Constitution. And the LWF knows that. Because we, they asked for copies of our Constitution, they know this is how we enter into formal agreements for full community. The other thing that's important, though, in the NALC is you don't have Big Brother looking over your shoulder in terms of what you do with your local congregation. Pulpit and altar fellowship with others are determined by the pastor and the leaders of each local congregation. We don't tell you who you can put in your pulpit and who you can't put in your pulpit. So no matter what agreement exists, whether or not a person comes and preaches or teaches in your congregation is a matter of pastoral and congregational responsibility and duty to make that determination. That does not change no matter what we decide. Uh, uh, so it, it's very important to, to understand that the nature of any agreement that we enter into does not change the responsibility of local leadership to make those determinations for each congregation. Uh, and, and so I, I think uh, we, we get carried away with what the past has been in terms of these large-scale ecumenical involvements and pronouncements without consideration for the local congregation. No one is forcing anything upon any of our congregations, nor does the LWF have any power or authority to do so. They, they state specifically that they don't have the power to regulate the doctrinal uh, or ecclesial decisions in any group that is a part of it. No one would ever give away uh, what we've worked so hard uh, to put together uh, in, in terms of the NALC. Uh, so I want you to know that that, uh, and more information about that will be coming, uh, but those things are also important for us to remember as we uh, consult and, uh, uh, and, and make these determinations uh, moving forward. So, yes, yeah. Um, my name is Linda White. One thing that uh, concerns me, and I, I felt here, is when you hear the division, it hurts your heart. Yes. And any of you who have been a Lutheran for more than 30 years, let me see that hand. Right. We've been through a change. We went from the American Lutheran Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church to be merged. I, Jan can remember, I wrote a play for some young people, and the name of the play was called The Reformation Continues. And from day one, the Lutheran Church has been in reformation. It's never stopped being in reformation. And we don't want it to stop, we want to improve. But the one thing that I want so much out of our new birth here is to stop worrying how much of a good Lutheran I am and the concentration go back to how can I be a good Christian? You know, Martin Luther was not a Luther. Jesus was a Jew. I want to be a Christian. And I think by simplifying and by bringing the politics out of this church and removing all of those barriers, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to be the good, solid Christian without um, explanations without apologies, without you know subplots here and this, that, and the other. We just want to be Christians, and we want to be the best Christians that we can be. And that's what I want the NALC to be. Being uh, with Lutherans, it, it 
pains me to admit that, since my own family is that, I'm that, I'm still a member of St. Luke Lutheran Church in Springfield, Ohio, even though it doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> still on the church, and that's kind of a metaphor for what I've been going through for many, many years. So I just want to say official thank you, and I want to say to all of you, thank you for standing firm on the Word of God so that I can come back to the church. Thank you very much. Harvey 
Mozilla Interim at Holy Trinity in Trout. I'm David Gatula and I serve at uh, Union Lutheran Church here in Salisbury. Ken Reed, I serve Concordia Lutheran in China Grove. Any other? Okay. Yes. Mike Redauer, I'm pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Fletcher, North Carolina, the mission congregation. Thanks to all of you for your help. Glad to tell you we'll be increasing our membership by 20% of new members coming in this month alone. Yeah. Mark Ryman of St. John's in Ashbrook. I believe we have one seminarian as well. Sonia Britton. I'm serving Union Lutheran Church here in Salisbury. And I met you earlier, Doug Hefner, here at Salem, and uh, it's so good to have you all here. Thank you for being here today. And hey, Doug, thank you for hosting us. You're quite welcome. Good Oh, yes. <laughs> the Hefner boys, you have to watch out for that. That's right. You got Pastor Yes, sir.
I believe that we currently have at least one church that's already taken a first vote and is waiting for the second vote. There may be one or more that are in the same boat. Bishop, do you have any information on this? So there's another one in Charleston. That's, uh, they, have a, they ran a precursor vote, and now they believe they have the votes lined up. They're ready to take their first vote. And uh, the bishop has already been in there and speaking, so they're ready to go. And the church in Lexington, have they, are they finished? Uh, no, I think they're, I still think they have to finish their second vote. I don't okay. know, not yet. And there are at least a couple of others that are that are moving along that line. Yes, Frank. Church in Lexington's first vote is in October. Their first vote is in October. Okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Another event, not to leave out the women. Carolina's Lutheran Women's second annual convocation is October 13th at Emmanuel Rockwell. Information is on our new website aptly named carolinaslutheranwomen.org. carolinaslutheranwomen.org. October 13th was the date and the, the time and place again, so people can Emmanuel hear. Rockwell. Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Rockwell. And Starting is there a time? 930, I believe it is. 930? Very good. Information and registration on the website. Any other either events to report or questions? Thank you all again for coming to this discussion and worship event and look forward to seeing you around the states.
please serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.